Okay. Greg, man, I appreciate you sitting on the hot seat with me. I'm going to fall back. I figured I'd just um, go. I didn't, I didn't want to um, get into things, personal things. However, just a glimpse of your personal life. And once again, anyone who spends any time with you in these back chats, they know that you, you, you're very um, intellectual how, and they know your strategy in um, the strategy in which you convey the message may possibly make people feel inferior, which can trigger certain type of emotions. And I, I, I was just, my personal opinion was maybe you get some type of, um, some, some kicks out of it, you know what I mean? And I would love to see it on a higher plateau to see if those same kicks would fly. But at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter. I appreciate you for um, having this dialogue with me, bro. Thank you, man. I appreciate that. Like That's what's yeah. happening. And with that, I concede. Good money, good money, man. Okay, okay. A little warm. I'm feeling that. I'm thinking that um, the next... Contestant is Craig. Are, are you able? You good now? You yeah, able? I'm good. I'm good. Oh, yeah. I'm good. Just I'm how good. quick you you got off the um, you unmuted yourself, right? I'm like, oh, okay, he good. That was a quick reaction. Yeah. All right, brother, you got five, but it's a little lax. Might make it a little more than that. Who knows? If you get too crazy, then it's just five. But do your thing, man. Kick it off. Question All number right. one. All right. All right, Gregory. All right. So. Now, Greg, you have been in the lion's den for a very long time. You know what I'm saying? I met you when I was at the age, I believe, of 22. Now, since we all know each other pretty well, I have a kind of good understanding of your evolution and your change. So when you first got here, right, in the back chat, and this is a question I've been meaning to ask you, right? What have charged you to change from your spiritual belief of being a Zaytanist to a more. Okay. Well, ironically enough, I'm I'm a, I'm a star with it with a foundation. Um, it really isn't that much changing going on for one. Um, so one thing that's in between those two things is Garveyism. Garveyism was the link that led to me even looking at more science in a way where I wasn't just trying to chop it up, feeling like they were some traitorous turncoats that's trying to pull us back into an Arabized version of Islam. That's how I looked at the, at the Moors pretty much ever since I found out about it, until my president, the president of my division, gave me an order as a Garveyite to learn as much about more science and noble Ali as I can and to figure out an ideological and subjective bridge as to how Moors and Garveyites unite what we agree upon, so on and so forth. And that's what led to me realizing that I had never done that before, that I always came at it from a destructive, criticizing point of view. So for one, Garveyism was the bridge. Now, in order to explain an evolution from a theistic saintness under the demonolatry umbrella to make a transition into Garveyism and evolution into more science, I would have to give a brief backdrop because again, this, this isn't just a, you know, red fish, blue fish, one fish, two fish type of thing, even though many people may think so. So I know that when a lot of people hear saintism, right? It's two things that usually come to mind. One's think about thinking about people who are glorifying the biblical bad guy or adversary, or they're thinking about atheists and punk rock with a lot of piercings and wearing gothic clothing and so on and so forth, like Anton LaVey. What people really don't know that much about, though, is that the saint of most theistic saintness, the saint within most true demonolatry, traditions that didn't stem from Judaism, Christianity, and or Islam don't look at Satan nowhere near the way that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam does. They're only the same in name alone. So what I was taught and what I studied and learned 
was deeply rooted in something that many people call hermeticism, which in layman's terms was a love child between Greek philosophy and Kemetic spirituality. Ended up transforming the Western world as we know it. From that came a lot of different lodges and schools of mystical um, scientists, if you ask me. Contrary to popular belief, contrary to those who just look at things from a biblical standpoint and think that everything else has to go with that biblical standpoint, there are, first off, self, God as we know it, the creator being self, being at the epicenter of everything that is conscious. I like the fact that they did not try to push a particular point of view down anyone's throat, that we were actually encouraged to learn from everywhere chew up the the meat and spit out the bones, utilize what we can practically apply and discard what's just getting in the way. Because of that, I always had a green light to evolve and expand, especially when when I saw the creator being at the epicenter of my consciousness. So because of that, I always had the room to develop and evolve. The way that true demonologists who are not influenced by Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, the way that they look at deity is the same way with a different verbiage that Marcus Garvey and, in fact, Noble Jarali looked at deity as well. So my transition was effortless. Mainly, it was verbiage. The big differences were in Garveyism, I incorporated my occult science, my knowledge of self, my metaphysics, so on and so forth, into a race-first paradigm. I ordered, I reordered and restructured my life, my way of thinking, my output and everything along the lines of what that red, black and green stood for. So that was the real difference with that because the knowledge is universal and it's all about how we utilize it. With more science, I took it a step further with engulfing myself in a national body politic and go for myself in the national body politic that was also race first, that was my own, that would, that does not signify me acknowledging my origins being when these people had us, put us in slavery, and start calling us Negro, Black, and colored. But when it comes to the closest place to find Allah being in the heart, when it comes to Allah and man being one, what time never was, what spirit man was not, when it comes to as above, so below, as within, so without. It was an effortless transition. The verbiage, the collective, the traditions may have been different, but the knowledge of self and the knowledge of the world around us was the same. So I say all that to say it was an effortless transition. Hmm. Okay. So basically saying it was an easy transition when you moved over into the more science, into a, a stronger and better body. Okay, I understand. Well, that's good, that's good. Now, next question, right? Now, with hermeticism, right? And, you know, I'm still very new to these things, Greg, and I'm pretty sure that you're an expert in it. Hermeticism cover, you know, very different spiritual practices is alchemy and even some forms of mysticism when it comes down to manipulation of nature. So one of the things I wanted to ask you, right, with hermeticism and with these abilities which are somewhat paranormal with the study and the practice of the science of that mystical art, how how are you so adapted into showing Black people a new form of power according to hermeticism? Apologies. I had some calls that I had to get rid of real quick and it threw off my speaker and had it on the ear instead of the speaker. And then I put it back on speaker just long enough to hear the end of your question. Could you please repeat the question for me, sir? Oh, no problem. No problem. So since you said pretty much your main body of thought came from hermeticism, especially when you transferred over into being a more and mm-hmm. since hermeticism deals with a lot of um you know come on great since since hermeticism deals with a lot of mysticism um alchemy and other forms of mystical practices and even abilities how does that empower you and other black people 
Well, thought is the cause of it all. Like was said in the Holy Quran of the Morris Science Temple of America. Um, we've all heard of placebo. We all heard of mental conditioning. We've all heard of programming our subconscious and things that resonate in our wake, waking state with a, with a large degree of, of impact and emotion with it will resonate and go into our subconscious and become a part of our automatic program. For us, first and foremost, to see ourselves as part divine changes a lot. When we look at or perceive what we consider to be our source of power, our source of salvation, our source of enlightenment, to be outside of ourselves, it automatically puts us in a more inferior position. So there'll be certain things that won't even cross our minds to even give ourselves a chance to decide upon because we've already programmed ourselves to think that that's impossible. Whereas on the flip side, if we do recognize, and that doesn't say that you can't recognize divinity in everything. And my way of thinking that hasn't changed throughout my path is that divinity or death within everything, even in Islam, you have the first pillar, which is the oneness of Allah. If Allah is one, then how in the world can I say that Allah is not in me and not in you and not in that tree, not in that dog over there, not in that cat? If he's in everything, he or she, depending on how ones look at it, is in everything. So I would say that having a knowledge of self and, and, and seeing the divinity within oneself empowers oneself to not only expand their minds to other possibilities, but also have the courage to do. As long as we look at what other people are doing or what other entities have. Did, 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 did this signal drop? <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, he doesn't come back cursing. So let's all be quiet. So he doesn't come back cursing. As long as we all have, as long as we have the power and understanding of who and what we are, that in and of itself opens us up to more of our power and more of our possibilities. So in that way, another thing is the idea of putting divisive things away and focusing on our common goals and common enemies with the belief that unification is the only solution, like Garvey said, where there's unity, there's strength, like Noble Ali said. These are things that were already in hermeticism or hermetic mysticism, some may say. Um, these things in and of themselves Anything that'll put us in a position to see ourselves stronger and anything that'll put ourselves in a position to expand our way of thinking, expand the possibilities that we would see ourselves having, then that's something that can help us individually and collectively, in my humble opinion. Hmm. Okay, okay, okay. I see what you're saying in your humble opinion. Now, this is another thing, Greg, and I just wanted to add on to this with that question, right? And it just means talking. Now, and I want your opinion on this. Now, Isaac Newton was also famous for practicing hermeticism. You know what I'm saying? And he was known for having a very calculative mind, you know what I'm saying? Um, finding the theory of universal gravity, et cetera, et cetera. Just in, and it can be in your own words and you can just give me just anything. How have you used, well, how have you compared to this man since you have pretty much the same practice? How did you, how were you able to actually manifest the greatness that he manifested? Who is the he that you're referring to? Well, I basically said Isaac Newton um, practiced hermeticism also. And, you know, he was famous for finding the formula of universal gravity. So, I want to ask you, how have you basically compared, well, not compared, but how have you actually 
benefit from the same practice that he benefited, um, 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 not benefited, but um, benefited from. And how have you shared that with black people? Like how he shared the formula of universal gravity with everybody else? Um, first off, I must first say for clarity purposes, right? That even though mm -hmm. words like hermeticism, mysticism, they're umbrellas. I understand that. I understand umbrellas. Yeah. So just because you you pick, you know, Isaac Newton over here that was in mysticism. And then you have Eliphas Levi over there that's mysticism. Alistair Crowley over here that's part of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn before it went elsewhere. And then you have me. Who's to say that we all think alike? It's similar to the NBA, right? Like everyone's playing basketball, but you have different teams that have different styles. Some people are running guns, some are half court, some just shooting the threes all day and, and running pick and pops and stuff like that. Others will take it down low like they still like when Boogie Cousins and Anthony Davis were together. Different styles, different collectives who have different talents with different understandings, different philosophies of the game, different playbooks. Mm -hmm. So I just mm -hmm. don't want things to be construed as if they're all there's no council of Nicaea or a council of Jumna with mysticism and hermeticism right. on the contrary. Hermeticists used whatever culture, whatever verbiage, whatever ammo to convey universal knowledge, whether they were in Christian, Hebrew, Islamic, or other societies. They would use whatever it was at their disposal to convey information that will hopefully be applied is to be in a not having a knowledge of self. Now, with that being said, um, honestly, I would start with the biggest thing, right? The mm -hmm. biggest benefit that I have been able to achieve and that I have been able to share with others mainly is by looking myself in the mirror. When somebody becomes their own God, they also become their own devil and adversary. You can't have one without the other. So myself, you know, over a decade ago and many others go into it like, yeah, I'm going to be my own God. Won't tell me what to do. I could be able to say no to this. I could do what I want. But the flip side of that is recognizing that you're your own adversary and getting in your own way and might have to use that free will and decision making to hold down or, or not do certain things that ones want to do for a greater path or a greater end game for a brighter future. So the first thing was being able to look in the mirror and start to truly take accountability for my life and my actions. And that's when I stopped getting in trouble. That's when I stopped going back and forth to jail. That's when I stopped trying to be like everybody else that I was seeing instead of being afraid to be myself and be different. And that caused conflict. And I may not be cool with the, with the cool guys. All of that came from leaving conventional Abrahamic religions alone and getting a dose of a knowledge of self. And that's a gift that's kept on giving because I probably would have still been going back and forth to jail, still trying to tell myself that I'd do it better this time, still trying to be the next great, great rap artist in and out of jail somewhere. So I just use that. That's a way that has been beneficial. It has opened up more of my ingenious talents and in reference to what you may be referring to as demonic inspiration, where ones can end up getting epiphanies and getting bigger, you know, Da Vinci type visions of stuff. Um, I'm going to keep that to myself until I'm able to capitalize off of it. You know, you don't build your shields on the battlefield and warning shots are only for warnings. Not when you really want to shoot some shit. Excuse my French. That's interesting. So I understand it with yourself, but I wanted to, I needed you to answer for others also. Well, first off, the same thing I said, um, a lot of people being able to look in the mirror, being able to face accountability, being able to put one's defense mechanisms at bay. Also, so, so that helps others who I've helped and conveyed that to. They've used it to see themselves more as well. Another thing is being the message that I bring and not being afraid to initiate things. 
that is, uh, as we all know, when you see one or two other people doing something already, it's much easier to, to join. So I feel as though I've helped people by doing that, by being a catalyst, by sticking my foot out there, being ready to be involved. I've shown people examples of unselfish leadership, being somebody who's a leader in many different things, and I can still get my hands dirty and be a teammate as well. We have to be able to be a chief at up sometimes and an Indian in, in other times. We got to learn how we the, the greatest leaders, the best leaders are the greatest followers. Ones that were able to have a, a high teachability index. Mainly to get out of their own way. And another way that I have helped a lot of people is that I'm the one person that many people who have been called crazy most of their lives, who people think are crazy. I'm that one person that helps them realize that they're not crazy and that the majority of people are the ones that are crazy and they call us crazy who are anomalies, who are divergents, who don't see things the same way as they do, who are not afraid by the same things that they're afraid by, nor incentivized by the things that they're incentivized by. So I, I, I believe that that is something that I've helped others with and then they have helped others with as well increasing the bonds of fraternity and friendship in a nutshell. Mm, okay, so you believe. All right. Now, next question, Greg. Now, Marcus Garvey, right? And I have to be honest with you. He is one of my favorite African-American leaders. You know, he was a powerhouse and he was able to bulldoze a society to molded to how he wanted with his masterful piece of creation. You know what I'm saying? So, but with every great leader, there is always controversy. Now, Garvey, just like every leader, held himself up high and a leader should because the leader has to have that confidence. But the question I would like to ask you is this, right? Why is it that people like, you know, James Weldon Johnson, um, Robert W. Bang, no, um, just other individuals who had the same idea as Garvey were unable to work with him since he had this philosophy of race first? Well, ironically, the last sentence or two that you said indicates that they did not have the same philosophy and that they did not um, see things the same way. On the contrary, they saw things in the opposite way. You're talking about those who are part of the Garvey Must Go campaign. Like you say, Weldon Johnson, um, guy made Ebony and Jet, W.B. Du Bois, a lot of the Negro Boule. Arist uh, aspiring aristocrats. Now, before I start this, I'm going to be as unbiased as possible since I'm on the side of the separatists and not the integrationalists. I'm going to be as unbiased as possible. And my personal opinion, just as a, as a subset, I believe that it will take the field and the house to truly take the plantation. But with that being said, you have a blue collar versus white collar. You have a aristocratic versus ones that get their hands dirty. You have those who are more inclined to agriculture and industrial labor than they were to subjective paperwork, corporate type stuff. I'll just put it like that. So you had two different ways of looking at it. The ones who you were talking about, they were more so less confrontational, more tolerant. They had been more privileged. They had seen different shades of racism. They were ones who, like the house, they would be more more prone to um, going along to get along to a certain extent, to 
play the slick role. Hopefully being a spook that sat by the door with it. But in most cases, not. Another thing was they didn't like someone who was not of an aristocratic stock. Honestly, they also didn't like someone who wasn't light skinned, who didn't have quote unquote fairer features and all of that, which is still considered a, a stake higher than those who had more distinctive so called Negroid features and of a darker melanated hue. They also didn't like that he was from another place, from Jamaica. They didn't like that somebody from Jamaica that didn't have the degrees that they had and the money that they had and the temporary quasi pseudo privilege that they had by being good boys and girls. They didn't like that they had someone who had none of that and was able to galvanize our people the way that they did. On top of that, they were afraid that Garvey's message and those who felt like them could end up getting them hurt or getting them in trouble. They were still under the assumption that if we were more civilized, more intellectual, if we would get along more and be get a good job, a good education, and, and take most of the BS that come our way, that things could get better. If we did, but as we could tell, integration hasn't really made anything better. Now I'm not a, I'm not a, um, a fan of segregation, but I'm definitely a proponent of separation. And I feel as though, like most house niggas, they feel like if, if the field would get them in trouble. If those in the field try to bang on Massa, then Massa might think that they had something to do with that too. Massa might kick their ass out the kitchen too, and they might not be under the fan and shade. They might have to get out there in the field with the rest of the niggas if the rebellious niggas keep on talking this shit and keep on trying to buck against the rules. So I believe that it was dual and, and twofold. And on one end, they saw a competitor that had the people that they didn't feel like were qualified for it. And they would rather him be gone so that they could be the um, puppet, like the, the puppet leaders of black America, where they could continue to pacify us and look like they're doing something. But they're all behind closed doors, they compromise and save their own behinds. Um, they were not, and so on, right, like I said, on one end, they were incentivized by getting a rival out of the way so that they could keep their prestige. And on the other end, they were terrorized by feeling like those like Garvey and other um, preeminent pioneer Garveyites were fooling around to get them in trouble and how Whitey looking at them funny. And maybe they wouldn't be able to keep that nice job of theirs. Maybe they wouldn't be able to get them smiles and shake hands in the rooms with them if these old disgruntled, rebellious, belligerent Negroes keep on bucking against Massa. So in all actuality, it was the same ideological difference between the field and the house. And Marcus Garvey was in the field. Interesting. Well, here's my problem with that grid, right? Now, this is just me personally, and I'm going to give what I've been looking over with Marcus Garvey. Um, the individuals that I mentioned, and the reason why I asked this question was because during that time, there was a lot of killings of our people going on. And I find it appalling that there is always an issue people in the midst of our enemies. Don't you agree? So... Once I decided to go further and look into Garvey as an individual, if I was in his shoes, I noticed, of course, he was proud of his blackness. He boasted an ideology that he was pure. He was untainted. He was not white in no matter or no fashion. But with the individuals that you mentioned, right well that i mentioned like robert and especially we the voice how he basically belittled them and mocked them for being of a lighter skin or, or being privileged this is what caused an issue between them um that's what caused robert to write his madness about garvey um and they started actually looking to further issues with him and his issues of lighter skin people getting more privileged even though that is true 
And he did attack that. But one thing I noticed with Garvey, he did attack lighter skinned blacks and claimed that they were, um, they pretty much are like white people almost, since they get the privileges like them almost in his eyes. So because of that, right, why do you feel, and I see you shaking your head, but why do you feel that that is basically false when these people who are light skinned came with this strong groundbreaking evidence? Man, bro, first off, where's the strong groundbreaking evidence, okay? You're making assertions, right? With no type of substantiation behind them. You're, you're getting information from people who definitely use propaganda, who were definitely working with J. Edgar Hoover, who definitely had all types of baboon, caricature, big lips, calling all, all type of distinctive so-called Negroid features. These people that you were talking about took the assault, the offensive. Did you know that the first place that Marcus Garvey visited when he was in New York was the, um, what's their names? Um, the boy now, um, Universal, what is it called? United, NAACP. First place he went was the NAACP. Mm -hmm. Trying to link up with them, trying to do work with them. And it was kind of okay. Did you know that when W.B. Du Bois went to Jamaica before Garvey even came, that W.B. Du Bois was a guest speaker in the UNI event? Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Yeah. So I'm asking you why would you. somebody hold on? No, no, bro. No, because you be insinuating things and inserting things of stuff that you have. And you say it as if you're really thorough I, with. I, I, but I mean, another I, thing I, that you said was that he was engaged in colorism. So I'm going to ask you this. Did you know that the first two boats, steamships, that the UNIA purchased, do you know that they got there from a UNIA member that was that was passing for white? I, I understand. He was a part of the what, High Executive what, Council? I, well, what I'm asking. Why, did, why I'm didn't asking, he beat him up? I'm, I'm why, why didn't he you. kick him out? It was great, all type great, of light-skinned folks. Great, 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 don't, you, great, don't, you great. Know, don't you know that Mar Malcolm X's parents met at the first convention in okay. August of 1920 in okay. Harlem. Okay, great, great. His I'm dad was light skinned, uh, but I'm his dad, Earl you. Little, had, had a UNIA division everywhere he went. He was a UNIA president. He was a real yeah. Garveyite. That's why the Klan caught up with him and killed him. Okay, because he was playing me. that red, black, and green flag everywhere, and he was light skinned. Like I have a plethora of examples of such. Uh, if I knew I'm that you were going to. If I knew that you were going to take Garvey must go campaign people and yeah. use what they say and try to make it be truth and, and, and all this overwhelming evidence instead of being real with it, then I would have brought the um, philosophies and opinions with me. I would have brought um, race first with me. The very um, next time you try to throw Garvey under the bus and say things that are historically oh unfounded, God. let me know first. So that I could get real materials and real literature and just blow blow the head right off this straw man that you're formulating. But okay. he was not a colorist. On the contrary, mm -hmm. the UNIA had people of all hues. He was against colorism. He was against us being lumped up as either color or mulatto. What he was trying mm -hmm. to do was make Negro and black be universal instead of them cutting us up between who's more light skinned and who's more dark skinned and you're more like us and you he tried to put black brown and all that all in the one category even though he did he at time he did not want to keep using that terminology mm -hmm. i remember reading something i think it was in volume three of the philosophies and opinions only one publication of that one he had kind of like a black and white scarface type of cover to it came out in the 70s he was um, talking about a time where we would leave the Negro terminology alone. But at the time, you had black and colored, mainly colored, and mulattoes and stuff. So that was one of his ways of trying to unify the so-called light skin, so-called dark skin under one thing, which right? was the Universal Negro Improvement Association. So for you to come on here and try to insinuate that he was dissing them because they were light skinned and then and they was just defending themselves is complete bullshit. These people were with J. Edgar Hoover. These people were up with COINTELPRO, crying to J. Edgar Hoover. 
they the ones who put J. Edgar Hoover on him in the first place. Did you even know that that was the first person that J. Edgar Hoover ever targeted? That was the first person that he was afraid of being the black messiah. And it was them same people you talking about that was calling and that was trying to get them in trouble and that was tricking on them. So for you to be sitting up here, and man, like you bogus, bro. Like learn more about both sides before coming on here live trying to throw dirt on Garvey name. Study to show uh, yourself nobody, approved, no, no, like the nobody, Bible that you claim to adhere no, to. No, 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 nobody, nobody's throwing dirt on Garvey. Study to I show yourself, said, man. Please. You just said that he oh, was a colorist on, and that he was dissing other black oh. leaders because they were light skinned, bro. So yeah, you can't tell yeah. me that you ain't throwing no dirt on his yeah. name. You talking about somebody yeah. who claimed to be race first? Oh, that was talking God. about all us being unified, and you saying that he was petty and a colorist and was dissing and hating on these people because they was light skinned. Oh, you can't oh, tell oh, me oh, you ain't throwing him under no bus, oh, bro. Oh, you don't oh, know oh, what you're oh, talking oh, about. I don't. Oh, you need oh, to yeah, study yes, more. Yes, 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 I do. I understand what I'm talking about. Well, prove what you're now, talking hold on, about. Hold on. Prove now, him initiating wanna... the people who collaborated in the Garvey Must Go campaign. Prove that hold on, hold on. he initiated the attack uh, and was and was banging on them being light skinned. Prove that because there is no evidence for that. You pulled great, that out of crack of your great, behind great, somewhere. Great, great, great. Can we get back to the question? Now here's the thing, right? And this is what the major issue was before you did the whole famous Greg rant. Oh, because right? you be lying though. Hold you got on, loaded hold lying hold on, questions. Hold on, hold on, man. No, I don't. No, I don't. No, I don't. But this is what I'm trying to ask you, right? Now, since Garvey was race first, right? I'm going to ask you a question again, right? Since he was race first, right? And he believed in the so-called superior stock of Negro. I mean, it's been times where he even boasted about it himself. And even these people that I mentioned even got his own words, you know? No, I don't remember verbatim. But what I would like to ask you is this, right? Why is it that when it came down to working with these other black um inspirational figures right now you said that you know they're with the government and all these things right but he was mainly closest to we the voice why was it that he was not able to cast aside his differences with them in order to work with them and to push and to become better again you're people? perpetuating a false negative i mean a false narrative bro a negative narrative you're insinuating that he couldn't let his bullshit go with them when again, when he was in Jamaica before ever attempting to visit Booker T. Washington at Tuskegee Institute. W.B. Du Bois was a guest speaker in the UNIA when he came to Jamaica. That's not somebody who has a problem with somebody that they can't get over. When he came to Harlem, the first place he went was NAACP and had a very long meeting with W.B. Du Bois, because he said when he was down there in Jamaica, man, you ever come up there, let's work together. You feel me? Hit it from two different angles. He came up here trying to do that. And if you really look, man, have you ever read a piece from the Negro world before? Have you ever read the Chicago Defender in the 1920s before? I don't think you have. Because if you did, you would see when the shit hit the fan and when it started. It started with publications from these people that you're trying to turn into the victim. You're trying to turn Garvey Must Go, J. Edgar Hoover, COINTELPRO operatives into the victims of Marcus Garvey attacking them and not being able to get over his bullshit. You playing, bro. You playing. And I would really I ask you to read first just the philosophies and opinions of, Mar of Marcus Garvey. And read I the did, official uh, biography of the UNIA called Race First, Orange mm -hmm. Cup. At least mm -hmm. read those um, beginning basic materials before you come on somewhere talking like you know what you're talking about. Any and everybody who right. sees this that knows anything about Garvey would know that you don't know what in the world you're talking about. Okay, you okay, skim okay. some things, okay, pull okay. some things out, and piece them all together, and you really bear false witness on him. Mm -hmm. Just go to the Chicago Defender, man, in the 1920s. Look at the Negro world in the 1920s. Look at the dates when the, when the scathing article started to come out. And then you will see which ones kicked it off with whom. And that's easy to do. 
but you haven't, which is why you're saying this inaccurate stuff about one of our ancestors. Okay, Greg. This is one of the main reasons why I asked this, right? Now, we understand, and this is this is coming to the last, this is like what the fourth question. Now this will be the last, right? Thank but you. The reason why, oh, no, you're welcome. You're welcome, man. <laughs> the reason why I've asked this right now, we understand that Garvey was a very well versed entrepreneur, right? We understand that he had rivals. But what I want to understand is from you, and since you are a member of UNIA and he's such an inspirational figure towards you, is the complaints of Negroes that followed him with the loss of money, for example, the Black Star Line. So I would like to ask you, right? What do you feel that Garvey did wrong with his what was his shipping company, correct? With his ships, what do you think he did wrong with that? I mean, okay, I'm gonna answer your question and I'm gonna do it within context. First, I want to express the disgust in the trajectory and direction. And That's what cool. you're asking me, you come with That's some cool. loaded questions at first, insinuating flat out falsehoods. Then you try mm -hmm. to flip the narrative around and make it where he's the aggressor and they're the victims of his scathing attacks. And now you want me to focus on what he did wrong instead of the plethora of things that he did right. But it's all well. I just want I just want to let you know that I see that. Pat. That's cool. That's cool. That's cool. I, think, um, hey. I would refer you to another publication that would mm -hmm. increase your information and education on Garveyism called The Course mm -hmm. on African Philosophy. Mm -hmm. In the introduction of The Course of African Philosophy, he said that he could, if he could do it all over again, because this was post-deportation, when he was not allowed in the United States anymore, the closest he could get was Canada, due to him being a British citizen. It was during this time that he said that if he would go back and change anything, he wouldn't have trusted so many people. So trusting too many people, being too optimistic, not being, for lack of a better way of putting it, Machiavellian enough, was one of the things that led to an opening to having people who were compromised being able to compromise the situation. As we know now, it's hard to keep us together now. And the funny part about it, with all the social media and all that that we have, there still has not been a group amongst us that had six million due paying members. And we talking about in the 1920s. You had six million due paying members in Chicago, that was, I mean, in the United States of America that were paying their dues and in the Afro-Caribbean as well and in Latin America that were paying without internet, without PayPal, without debit cards. I mean, this was a time when radios were still running the airwaves. Now we have all of these things, all of these capabilities, and it's hard for us to get a hundred people together and solidify it and on the same accord for an extended period of time. So if you want to blame him for what those under him ended up doing, then that's fine. But Marcus Mosiah Garvey taught us to be accountable for our own actions. So for that answer, like he said, if he could do it all over again, he wouldn't have trusted so many people. I personally would not call him a phenomenal entrepreneur. He was a phenomenal speaker. He was a phenomenal organizer. That's what he was. And he didn't have many phenomenal um, economically minded people behind him because, again, most of the people who felt like that were too afraid of what they considered to be a radical message and didn't want to get caught up in the crossfire. They wanted to keep, you know, keep their nice job, keep their nice houses and keep their nice token nigga status. And then you had others who were jealous, like we all do. You had some who were pissed off because some people got removed for office for doing unscrupulous things. Yet they had people who were um, still loyal to them. I don't know what in many organizations you've been in, but when you have charismatic figures, they end up falling out with other leaders. They usually take some contingent or remnant of people with them. So you had that going on as well. Not to mention we're in the height of Jim Crow. You got the FBI playing real dirty, extorting people. They were extorting people. 
They were embezzling. They were killing people. They were putting a tight squeeze on people. And it's always, it's, it will always be a dime a dozen, a bunch of people who are willing and ready to sell their brothers out for 30 pieces of silver. All they got to do is pick them and hit them with the right incentive. And it's not nothing that me, you, Marcus Garvey, Jesus Christ, but Muhammad, uh, anybody else could do about it because we all have free will and, and our ability to make decisions. Hmm. That's interesting. That's interesting. But my problem with this whole thing, right? And, and first of all, you got to be a hell of an entrepreneur to own some damn cargo ships, man. You, you got to be one. So you, you got to give that to him, Greg. But my problem is, right, with that, right, when he has, when he testified in court, when his people spent the money, right, to get from point A to B for whatever business, right? A lot of them were left waiting. A lot of them were left distraught. You see what I'm saying? So I understand what you're saying with the espionage and the Europeans doing what they do. But what I'm trying to say is this, right? Since Garvey was able to amass all of this wealth, why was it, well, from his people, and of course for his people, but why was it that their priority was not given to them in abundance first? And why is it that many people testified against him, Greg? Hello? Did he leave? What the? Nah, my bad. I was trying to do something, man, messing with the controls, man. Button push my way right on the battle here. Apologies. Nah, you were, what was your what was you, your final question again? Uh, this is not the final question, but what I was asking was this, right? What a since shine. Marcus, no, uh, yeah, it's not. We got one more. But since Marcus, right, he had the backstar line, and I'm just gonna rephrase it. You know what I'm saying? I thought you were trying to kick me out, Greg. <laughs> But anyway, since Marcus had everything and all that um, together with the Black Star line and all that, um, since he lost um, an substantial amount of money and since a lot of people were disappointed and everything, why was it that they were not capable and able? Because these are the, his people that followed him that gave the complaints, right? But why was it that they weren't able to get what they paid for with Garvey? Okay, so... First off, wherever you invest in a corporation and you pay stocks in that corporation, there is a risk for a return on investment. Just basic, just, just basic stocks one-on-one. -on -one. Right, You're right. always risking, even like it was a risk with Apple before Apple blew up, with Microsoft, before Microsoft blew up. But neither one of them had COINTELPRO going on either. So, in a nutshell, I'll try to be um, less wordy with this one. How can I put this? They weren't able to for a few reasons, right? One is, is fractional sectarianism. Ones broke up when it wasn't a leader strong enough to galvanize and keep everyone together. Then again, you had also COINTELPRO with all type of operatives that they were paying and extorting and this or that. And then you have those who would happily get them out of the way so that everybody wouldn't be talking about them so much. Maybe they could get some more shine. Literally, the same type of stuff that we deal with right now. The same type of stuff that has us not having no steamships or no big ships doing import and export right now. The reason why we're not engaging in distribution, mass distribution of goods and services right now, because we ain't adhering to what was called the black print that Garvey brought in reference to collective economics. See, his ideology was what was sound. The ability to practically apply it has many hands on deck. And it takes that team like a football team. They either win or lose together, no matter how good the quarterback was. 
no matter how good the running back was, no matter how good the defensive lineman was, they win and or lose together. And it's the same way. So just because he was the head, the ideological father and leader thereof, doesn't mean that he was responsible and accountable for the decision making of others. And if that's what's trying to be implied, then it's just simply illogical. Hmm. Well, and I'm going to get ready to get to the next question. But the reason why I say that, that, you know, since Garvey dubbed himself as the emperor of his people, you know what I'm saying? He put himself on such this high status. I felt that maybe he should have been a little bit more honorable, even though it was not his fault. And when I meant by a little more honorable, he <laughs> should have paid his people back that invested in him instead of just leaving it high and dry. I understand how the corporation worked like that, but these are black people. You see what I'm saying? So that is why I'm bringing this up to you. Maybe Excuse me. it would have been. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Because no, 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 you keep on, on, Greg, instead of on, instead of doing on, questions, on, you keep inserting this bullshit on, in the middle, on, man. That's unfounded and true. Hold on, hold on, and I'm not going to let you smear that man like that, bro. I am not going to let you smear. Now, if what you have to say is grounded in truth. I'm going to roll it, with it, bro. It, you it, only supposed to be asking great, questions anyway. Great, great. This is not an interview on your feelings that's, on Marcus Garvey, bro. That's, that's, you throwing that's shot. You only talk about Marcus Garvey when you're talking to me. And it's always great. in a negative tone. Great. No, it's no, always no, trying great. to throw some type of dirt because you know I'm, how he I'm feels about go, how I feel about him. No, no. no and, that, and that's lame and shady. Okay. So okay. Great, great. Keep me, it to the questions. Me. Quit let me, spewing let me this bullshit let me, live, let me, bro, let me, let me, because you don't know what you're talking about. Come, come on. And come you know on, you Greg. don't know what you're talking about, come, but you keep on, on. Dude, when the feds, yeah. when the feds come at you for embezzlement, they lock your accounts up. Uh -huh. They seize your property. They seize your assets. Mm -hmm. So for you to sit up here and say that yeah. he was unjust or dishonorable for not paying them back, when they locked up all of his assets and kicked them mm -hmm. out of the country, mm -hmm. away mm -hmm. from his organization, away from the bank accounts, mm -hmm. away from the property, you bullshitting again. You keep trying to no. have a negative no. tone. No. Hold on, hold on, all right, Greg. check this out, bro. All I want, oh, with on, all due on. respect, is one more question yeah. from you. And I don't oh, want to hear none of your vitriol, oh, lace, oh, venomous commentary I, I don't, in I don't between. Even... This is a Q and A. I'm on the hot seat. I'm supposed to be answering oh, questions yeah, I, that were I know, asked of me. I know, I know, so I know, leave it I to know. the questions. I, I know, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, but I know you I, know, and you're doing wanted, it anyway. But trying but to be on, heard. But, but hold trying on, to be you, heard. Giving you compliments, you didn't care about that. And now, was, I don't care about you throwing dirt on Garvey's name. Oh, and this oh is a God. Q and A. Oh, so God. just leave it to the questions. This ain't here for you to tell your story, bro. I'm not trying to tell my story. About That's exactly you. what you're doing. So trying to uh, means nothing okay. when you're doing it. I can't Just leave it to the questions, did. bro. I don't want to hear no more commentary in between. Uh, Do you have any more questions? Not statements, questions. Yeah, I got some more questions. Okay, let me hear them. Okay, all right. I see you didn't want to hear that. That hurt man, that ain't no question, dude. Do you got questions, well, man? Finish. I'm not gonna keep playing with finish. you. I'm not gonna keep playing finish. with you. Finish, I'm gonna answer the question. I'm finna don't give me no more statements, bro. I'm gonna remove you when I hear okay. something that all don't right. sound right. like a all question. Right. You hear me? Okay, all right. Stop okay. playing, okay. bro. Okay, here's the last question, bro. I wasn't even playing. Man. Okay, so here's the last question, Greg. Now, with the last broadcast, right? I noticed that you mentioned parapsychiatry right now. We all with know the last that with the last podcast with Ratchet Craig, right? You know, oh. we realized that when you mentioned parapsychology, right? We understand that parapsychology deals with hypnotism, telekinesis, PSI, all those other abnormal things, right? But no. When you first hold on, hold on, Greg. Let, no, let me speak. Let me speak. Yeah, but you land again. You land a fraudulent not, foundation down. I'm, I'm not. I'm not trying to ask to, a loaded question. I'm not trying to. Do you want to find the definition, up, please? please? That's what we yeah. all know. That it's a definition for it that encompasses the semantic value of the term. Don't wing it with your shady connotations. 
I'm not giving shady connotations. Well, but at least know what it is, man. I know what it Before is. Before you give me a loaded question. Greg, 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 you can Google it, and it's the study of mental phenomena. All right? Like hypnosis. There we go. There we go. Okay, the study of mental so, phenomena. Not only that, it also covers hypnosis, telepathy. All, all of those are mental phenomena. Okay. Yes. Everything yes, you yes. finna say is a mental phenomenon. Yes. yes but parapsychology yes, are not relegated to the okay. Okay. extreme Great. cases Great. that you're referring to. They're just under the umbrella of parapsychology. But what's okay. up under that umbrella is not that umbrella. Do you understand that? Okay. Great. Great. So let mental me phenomena. Let me let me finish. Hold up, hold up, hold up. That's not the full definition. But let me finish my question. All right. Now it's bullshit, no, bro. No, no, I'm not just interrupting. Now, with parapsychology, right? Mental phenomena, different, you know, precognition, clairvoyancy, psychokinesis, all these abilities, right? And it is considered as a pseudoscientist by major mainstream scientists, right? Now, this goes off of definition. Now, I've noticed before you made your transition from Zaytness to more that you claim that you were able to do some of these unique phenomenons, like astral project, um, <clears throat> going to the alpha state, you know. Um, Ask your question, your please. Hold on, hold on, Greg. Hold on, please, hold on, hold on, hold this is not a question, on. man. On, it's a whole is. paragraph with hold all on. periods at the end. Greg. Ask your finish. question, man. Let me finish. You keep interrupting. Actual me. Well, you ain't start asking nothing yet. You study giving declarative statements. Questions are interrogative statements. This is third grade English. First chapter. Ask your question. Please. You're not going to interrupt me no more. Ask your question. All right, bro. Keep playing. Ask your question, man. Ask your question, bro. I don't want to hear no commentary. I don't want to hear what you think you that you think I think or what you think I know or how you think I move or how you think I see things. Ask your MF question. I'm trying to answer the question. But this how is you trying I'm to answer the here. question. You're not asking. Do you know the difference between the declarative and interrogative sentence, bro? Yes this, or no? This, this is what I'm saying. Do you know the I'm difference? You giving no, me declarative me statements. You're not giving bro. you ain't giving me not nan interrogative me, me, statement, bro. These ain't no great. questions. Great. Let me let me man ask the questions. question. Ask the question, bro. Now. I'm gonna tell you right now. If it ain't no, if it don't sound like no oh. question, five words in, I'm removing you. Period. I'm not gonna keep playing with you. You making so me anyway, think you're trying to so get anyway, some shine so, or something so, so, in a goofy so, so, so way. Anyway. So anyway, Greg, we know that mainstream scientists, like I've been trying to tell you for the longest is considered pseudo i mean we know that parapsychiatry is considered pseudoscience by majority of mainstream scientists because of its outrageous claims that it deals with like ghost spirits near-death experiences with um synchronicities of other realms and stuff like that right now that's not true man not, oh that's not God, true bro. this is what i'm saying ask your fucking question man because you keep putting lies in here the reason why they consider it pseudoscience is because they don't have proof of it being observed experimented on with a conclusion and that, and when they do that they can't be replicated something that's observed experimented on and concluded and other people could take that do the same thing and get the same conclusion. That's why it's called pseudoscience, because there's no proof through the scientific method that can verify and validate those claims. That's why. Again, okay. man, so, stop bringing okay. up. Just ask your man on my so, mama, bro. Yeah, if you do this again, to, you do this again to, and you out of here, bro. On, I'm man. not going to keep playing on, with bro. you. That's, ask your motherfucking question, man. That's what I'm trying to ask you, bro. You not. You keep trying to get these subsets, backdrops. I ain't coming back to him, man. I gave him a bunch, and he keep playing. He need to ask his question. He played this game bro, again, bro, trying to get his bro. pseudo information out before the question to load it up. I'm removing him. Period. Bro, bro. Ask your question, bro. I don't want to hear shit else but your question. I'm not going to keep telling you that no more either. 
Okay, great. My question is this, right? With parapsychology, right? Why is it that most scientists would not even consider it as a real form of science? You could have asked that shit like 15 anyway. So, like I was saying at first, they don't have proof, allegedly, according to them, they don't have proof of things being experimented on and concluding in laboratories. And they don't have the ability to replicate what people say they did to come to these certain conclusions. That's why most of mainstream says that it's pseudo. That's, that's their version. Now, I know of hundreds of articles and studies of people getting laboratory. It's harder. Another reason is because of bureaucracies with industries and institutions. There was a point in time. Do you know why the Wright brothers had such a hard time creating the first airplane? It was because the scientific and academic community at the time felt like there's no way that gravity would allow something so big and so heavy to stay in the sky for so long. So investors were listening to the scientists. The scientists were telling them that this shit pseudo, so they ain't put their money in. And then when they were proven wrong, guess what? They invented the law of flight. For a very long time, once thought that meteorites were pseudo. The scientists due to them seeing things be more condensed down here on the terrestrial side and seeing that the further you go in the atmosphere, the more thin the, the, the molecules, more space between the molecules. So they felt there's no way in the world that some hard rocks could come from up there where it's all thin air. Now that sounds funny now because we know better and they adjust it. But it's the same thing with this. If anybody thinks that science is the one institution that is pure, that is uh, immune to bureaucracy, to politics, to sponsors with money, giving directives to fulfill agendas that are not conducive with the purity of science, if y'all think that the industries are as pure as the science that thereof, then you're naive and ignorant. Every institution in this world has people who are financing and governing who will give their opinion and make moves based on their finances and getting more of it. The scientific community isn't immune. The academic community isn't immune or industry isn't immune. It's an institutional thing. So there are hundreds of articles. There are people who have enough money, very few, but there are people who have enough money to do their own laboratory research. There have been people for probably 100 years, at least 100 years, who have been conducting experiments on these things. And the things can be replicated. But the problem is too many people appeal to authority and they have this Santa Claus type of faith. Ironically, a lot of these people who claim to be atheists, who are, who are shit on any type of God or anything, their faith is in the, in the legitimacy and integrity of institutions that they know the same people who beat our ass and told us our name was Toby are still running. But for some reason, they want that to be pure. Sometimes I think a lot of them exchange their theology to turn academia into their new God, to turn the institutional powers that be into their new God, which is why I always challenge them to get scientific with these things that you're presuming to be pseudo. Because nine times out of 10, the stuff y'all reading, them people ain't looking to it either. And if it's anything that their sponsors can't control, and patent, make a bunch of money off of, they're going to bury it anyway. The same way Chrysler buried the engine that could run off water in the 1970s, for instance. I agree.
I know you're not going to let me get out no more questions, but that's it, man. I appreciate it. You can get out more questions as long as you leave them to questions. I don't want to hear what you think I, you think I know or what you think you're talking about because you've been wrong every time. And low-key, you've been wrong for two years. Just give me your questions, please. All right, right. The reason why I tried to stay and I asked if it was pseudoscience was because you have a certain science. I ain't asked you for your science. reason, bro. Just give me your question. Hold on, hold on. This is the question, bro. Let me let me ask let the me, question. Let me, let me wrap. The reason I asked you that question earlier, right? A specific scientist. Who's next? Brother Trenches or Sister Denise? Either one of y'all still on? Oh, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely. Okay. Peace and love, Brother Trenches, a.k.a. Hey, the Snapback yeah. Hebrew. Man, what's up, man? Shalom. Out. What's going on? Yes, sir. Yeah, I'm, um, as you can see, even though I'm in the hot seat, a lot of people didn't join. Right. A lot of people didn't join, even with me in the hot seat, right? I, th I know they scared of me asking them questions, but I guess they scared mm -hmm. the other way around, too, for whatever reason. That's kind of funny. But before I get to your mm -hmm. first question, I want just want to say a shout out to all those in the den with me and other groups and so on and so forth with me that's, that talk a lot of stuff, that act like they really want this smoke and all that. What's going on now? I'm in the high speed. I'm taking all challenges. I'm taking all questions. I ain't plead no Fifth Amendments or nothing. Where y'all at? That's what I thought. The link's still open. Big mouth heckler. With that being said, I would like to turn it back over to our brother Trenches so he can hit me with his first question. Yeah, and first thing, uh because I'm having a lot of technical difficulties myself. So in, in a lot of those people's defense, I, I just I ain't gonna make no excuse for them, but I will say it's a lot of that going on too right now with this uh internet. So uh yeah, first question I would like to well let me get some clarity first, because you already pretty much answered the questions that I'm about to ask uh for clarity, but I just wanna get it, like I said, for re clarification, I, I would say. Uh you are a, a, a member of the Moors Science Temple of America, right? Okay, and you are also a adherent to what you and I would call Damon. Oh, you, you're muted. You're muted. My bad. And you also an adherent to uh, Damonology, if I'm not mistaken. I converted to Islamism. Oh, okay, 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 okay. But like I was saying earlier, you know there aren't that many differences in reference to the knowledge and the gnosis and stuff like that. So it was an effortless transition. Okay, see, now you got to take my question in a different direction. Could you elaborate on that a little bit when you say those, those <laughs> differences aren't that different? <clears throat> what I mean by that is the hermetic principles that daemonolatry are grounded in are universal principles and truths that more science is grounded in. Like Allah and man being one, time never was when man was not, that we are seeds of Allah, therefore we have every attribute and potency of Allah, that we have the ability to, to form light and create darkness, make good and create evil, that we are what our forefathers were without a doubt of contradiction, and that we have the ability to operate and demonstrate and manifest and co-create while being about our father's business. It's the same in demonolatry and it's really the same in every mystical hermetic school that spawned from the sands of Kemet. And, and, and I can't even knock that because it's, it's almost exactly what you just said from the little I do know about both uh, schools of thought, it, it is very similar in that 